paragraph I wrote about the theme for tonight's reading, um, which is it's it's a very important theme, and it's it's also moving, and it's very shameful to those of us who are what we think of as white people in America. And so the theme, really, of the reading tonight is is about the internment of Japanese American citizens during World War II. And and, and I, I, I think, I imagine, I noticed reading Brian's book that some of his poems aren't only about that or exclusively about that, and the same with, I'm sure, Jody's poems. But, but certainly that theme informs their work a great deal. Um, OK, so we'll start with Jody. And um, her mother's family was interned at a camp in Wyoming called Heart Mountain, from which Jody took the title of her beautiful book, which was the winner of the 2012 Blue Light Press Poetry Prize. Her work has been published in Nimrod International, Spillway, Ekphrasis, Nagatuck Review, Touch, and many anthologies. So please welcome Jody Hoddle. I'm glad they got a cover for the piano, so now we can set things on there. So, so um, can you hear me okay? Good. Okay, good. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank Francesca Bell and Donna Emerson there. And the other members, I don't know how many of you are on the board or are members of the Marin Poetry Center, but thank you for inviting me to read and for all the ways you keep poetry alive and well. They really do have lots of events and, and perks for being a member. And I'm also really pleased to read with Brian, um, whose work I admire so much. Um, and thanks to all of you for attending tonight, especially the people who've come down from Sonoma County. I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me. So um, as I was growing up, I grew up on the East Coast, and um, I always remembered that there was a slim high school yearbook on the coffee table, or actually it was on a little end table, with my parents' wedding album, and I'd flip through the pages and look at the photos, black and white pages of, with photos of smiling Japanese Americans. They were all smiling. And um, there were class officers, just like any yearbook, senior portraits, members of clubs and sports teams. And there was my mom with her stunning smile. She had the most gorgeous smile. And she was the typical senior girl, which was like Miss Popularity and the campus popularity queen. Um, I didn't ask many questions of her, but I got even fewer answers. And um, I only had a vague notion of the impact of this event on my mother's lives and the lives of an entire minority group. And you know, I was a child of that um, generation. Um, I know most of you have some idea of what happened, so I'm not going to do a long introduction. But I'd like to share a few what I think are very key statistics with you before I start reading. From 1942 to 1945, over 110,000 people were forcibly removed from their homes and confined in prison camps. We've kind of updated the terminology to call them um, prison camps or concentration camps. Um, some of those who were incarcerated were the Issei, or the first generation immigrants, but approximately 77,000 or two thirds were American citizens of Japanese descent and more than half were children. The median age in the camp was 17. My mother was incarcerated at Heart Mountain at age 16, and Heart Mountain's in Wyoming. Somebody asked me that earlier. Um, if any of you know where Cody, Wyoming is, it's right near Cody, Wyoming, east of Yellowstone. Um, not all the poems in this book are about my mother, and sometimes people get confused about that, and neither is the cover photo, which is archival from the Bancroft Library. Um, and most of you here are writers, I know, so you're aware that even the most personal poems are a melding of influences and details, and the voices in this book are varied. But it does sort of go in um, kind of a chronological order, so should be fairly easy to follow. So I want to start. Um, I've done a lot of research, and I was shocked to find out that there were immigrants who had come to this country and served in the military in World War I, and then were incarcerated in World War II. And that was kind of shocking to me. I read this little blurb in a book about a man named Hideo Murata, who 
um, committed suicide rather than go into a prison camp. And he was actually from um, Santa Cruz, I think. Anyway, he did not leave a suicide note, so this is my imagining of what his suicide note might have said. It's called Unwritten Note. The news is on everyone's lips, like flies gathering on excrement. President Roosevelt has ordered our removal. Will we be taken from our homes like vermin? I know it must be a misunderstanding, gossip spread in these harsh times. I choke on acrid laughter. It is not possible. After all, I served my chosen country in the army in the Great War. So I go to see my longtime friend and sheriff of Monterey County. It is no joke, Hideo, you'll have to go. He can't look me in the eyes. When he finds my body hung in this rented room with my certificate of honorary citizenship, expressing honor and respect for your loyal and splendid service to the country. He will understand why I could not allow this noble country to tarnish its honor or mine. Um, so this next one is a little more personal. I found um, an actual little snapshot, black and white snapshot of my mom and a neighbor girl um, dated September 1941, and it just broke my heart to think that that was my mom not knowing what was coming toward her in a couple of months, in a few months. And so um, that inspired me to write this poem called Photograph, September 1941. Perched on a pile of watermelons, thumping hard, almost bursting. I'm bursting too, 16, brown from work in the fields, beaming at our family's harvest. My arm cr cradles Amy, our five-year-old neighbor, with straight bangs and frilly kerchief. We smile for the camera. In less than three months, the bombs at Pearl Harbor explode our lives. By spring, our family is imprisoned in a remote desert. Two years later, I leave my parents behind to go to college carrying this photo in my wallet and the dry taste of dust in my mouth. I never return home, never see Amy again. I still crave watermelons, remember their sweetness. Their, her family was truck farmers, so they raised a lot of cantaloupe and watermelon and things like that. Okay, and this next one is not verbatim, but as close as possible in this book, um, was told to me by one of my mother's dear friends, Marjorie Matsushita Sperling. And um, the train ride from wherever they were removed from their homes to the first stop, which was called a relocation camp, um, but it was basically like fairgrounds, and in my mother's case, the Portland Stockyard, where they had livestock. Um, that was their home for four months or so. And um, that train ride was indelible in most people's memory. And this is Marjorie's um, recollection of that ride told to me. So it's called Evacuation Day, June 5, 1942. At an empty station beside the train track's quiet gleam, it's dusk, the in-between time of a warm June evening. With brakes screeching, a truck skids to a stop at the platform, spilling out young soldiers, <coughs> rifles slung over their backs, drunkenly shoving each other, shattering a window pane in the station. With a hiss, a black train creeps in. Silent, the Japanese families approach, dressed in their Sunday best. Numbered and tagged, they line up to board, heavy, with what they are allowed to carry. Throughout the night, the train carries its freight from their Yakima Valley homes to an unknown future. Soldiers order, shades drawn, parade the aisles, point rifles as though their weary prisoners could escape. Pulling into the stockyard, the train shriek signals arrival, but still in darkness, the cargo 
hears only the clang of the closing gates. It's so grim, you guys are all sitting there. <laughs> okay, so, um, so this is another more personal one. My mom loved Shirley Temple, but I didn't quite understand. I mean, I just thought it was everybody's love of Shirley Temple. But it turned out later, I found out that people thought she looked like Shirley, kept telling her she was as cute as Shirley Temple. She had this great smile, and she had a dimple. But it didn't turn out quite that nicely. So it's called Look Alike. Once in a darkened theater, you stared as Shirley Temple danced on the screen. Those chubby cheeks and beaming eyes that made everyone smile. You looked just like her, all the adults told her. So you practiced your curtsy, pointing to the dimple on your cheek, flashed that smile that said you'd be a star. With your jet hair, your slanting eyes, you could never be the next Shirley Temple. When did you discover that what people told you was a lie? So on a lighter note, um, I saw a documentary once, and I've seen photos since then. Um, a lot of people came, and they had a lot of leisure time, and they had been farmers previously, many of them. And so these bleak barracks, they planted gardens. Um, and even at, um, like, um, 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 Tanferan, um, the racetrack, they created these beautiful waterfalls and rock gardens and stuff in the middle of the racetrack, even though they knew they were only going to be there temporarily. So um, I saw this documentary, and it just struck me so um, much that I had to write a poem about it. So it's called A Few Seeds. Some instinct told me I'd need those tiny packets of seeds smuggled in my pockets, cucumber, zinnia, pea, and chrysanthemum, even more than I'd need a coat to shield me from the stinging cold of a desert winter. A few seeds sown into improbable soil, watered using tin cans from the mess hall garbage, till tender shoots peaked above ground, reaching for the meager warmth of April. Now rambunctious morning glory vines tangle with cucumber, climb tar paper walls to disguise this bleak barrack. Snowy mums and golden zinnias wake and nod their noble heads. I stroll in the shadow of a guard tower as heat softens to dusk. In block after block, green patches of wonder are sprouting, cultivated by those like me who thrust into coat pockets tiny packets of hope. Um, I really write quite a few pieces about poems about um, art. Somehow it gives me the impulse to want to write. And I wrote this next piece about um, a woodblock by Henry Sugimoto. He did a whole series of woodblocks while he was in the internment camps or concentration camps. And he was an artist prior to the war. Um, but this one really struck me, and I think you'll understand what it was about, but um, it's called Thoughts of Him. And again, another shocking fact, if you don't know it already, is that uh, once people were incarcerated, they decided they needed more men to fight on the European uh, front. And so they first asked for volunteers, and many men volunteered. But then they also drafted people out of camp who did not volunteer. And so this is about a man who was drafted and had to leave his young wife and young son. And um, it's in the form of a high bun, which Renee taught me about, um, which is basically a prose poem with um, a haiku included in it. And I think you'll get that idea. So it's called Letter to a Nisei Soldier, 1944 after a wood block by Henry Sugimoto. The baby squirms in my arms, but I am far away with you. So much I want for you to return from Italy to meet Sumio, your son, for this constant gritty wind to cease, the suffocating heat to stop, 
to look out the window and not see a guard tower glaring at me, to have our two-month-old son grow up free as an American should. The face of a sunflower has climbed to our window. Yes, from the seeds you planted before shipping out. I tend it as though it has the power to keep you alive. Its face greets me each morning, like Sumi's. He looks just like you, two faces full of life. Night in Amachi, beyond guard towers, barbed wire, flickering desert sky. You hang, hanging in there? <laughs> okay, I'm going to depart. I've actually forgot to depart when I should have chronologically. Um, I've written two poems more recently um, that are both ekphrastic pieces um, that are not in the book. Uh, in 2013, spring of 2013, there was an exhibit at the Sonoma Valley Museum of Art, and it was all uh, uh, artist Roger Shimomura. And he does some really unique things. His paintings are about being Japanese American and the stereotypes around that, or about the um, internment camps. But he does it kind of in a, like a comic book, manga style, very, very um, striking. And so I wrote two pieces um, that are based on pieces of art kind of from the young person's point of view. One of them was actually this first one, no, couldn't have been him because Scott's a girl. Anyway, uh, it's called Skipping Rope, and it's from After the Shadow of the Enemy by Roger Shimomura, 2006. I'm trying to beat my own record, 23, 24. I'm the champion on the block, 27, 28. Even though I'm only 9, 31, 32, my best is 105. 36, 37. After a while, it gets hard to keep counting. 40. I hear Mama and Auntie Eileen inside laughing. 44, 45. Notice my shadow on the barrack. 52, 53. Kind of like one of those strips of film that looks like an inside-out picture. I see my pigtails fly, my feet too, a rope, a circle over my head on the tar paper walls. One. <laughs> and this next one is also based on a painting by Roger Shimomura called Classmates from 2008. Mary's in her red and white checkered dress with the bow at the neckline. I'm in my blue and green one with the ruffle. We hold the red apples she's brought, poised to take that first tart bite. Eager smiles on our faces. We're the same age, 12, even the same height, though I might have a half inch on her. Been in the same class, every grade in school till this year. Now I'm in a class inside barbed wire while she's outside. Now I notice the differences between us. She parts her blonde hair on the side. Mine runs down the middle, hair dark as the tar paper on our barrack. Her eyes are blue and round, mine suspicious slits. I see it now as plainly as the barbed wire between us. Okay, just two more from the book. Um, so now we're getting toward the end of the camps, and um, what happened was the government decided almost as soon as they incarcerated people and rounded them up that it had been an error. Not an error, I don't mean that. Um, that it was more than they could handle. <laughs> and so they started finding ways. They got a number of young men out to go work in the fields because there wasn't enough uh, help to harvest the crops that year. They asked people to serve in the military, and eventually they asked... Um, well, especially the American Friends, the Quakers sponsored, and other church groups sponsored people to get out to go to college, and that's how my mom got out. Anyway, by the end, they practically had to kick out the older people. That was about all that was left was the older people and the very young children. So this is about an older couple. Um, 
being forced to leave their barrack for the last time, and it's called sweeping. Our battered suitcases stand by the door, but they will have to wait while I sweep the desert dust one last time. Three years we've lived behind barbed wire. Now Papa and I are being forced out. Too old for farming, no home to go back to, our children already gone, Sam to war in Europe, a college in Chicago for May. I pause in the doorway of the barrack, our only shelter from the bitter winds, searing heat. No need for a last look at the sentinel of Heart Mountain. It will never be far enough away that I can't see it. I shove the broom hard into empty corners, shaping neat piles of sand. Papa chides, why clean? But I don't listen. Whoever comes to demolish these empty walls will see. We Japanese kept our homes clean. Okay, one last piece. Um, there's a phrase, shikata ganai, and it's uh, very emblematic about how the Japanese Americans felt about discussing this experience. Um, when they get out, they wanted to move on with their lives, which is really understandable, and they didn't want to talk about a traumatic um, period in their life. Um, there are a number of things in here that are biographical about my mom, but um, she never actually said this phrase. I just read it so many times, and it just seemed like she should have said it. Anyway, it's called Shikata Ganai. Shikata Ganai means it can't be helped, which translates scour and scrub till the smell of horse urine is a faint memory. Cobble a table out of scavenged fruit crates. Create a home from the stall that is temporary shelter for your family of six. Pretend you don't see barbed wire or soldiers with rifles and guard towers when you gaze at Heart Mountain on the horizon. Shikata Ganai, a tacit agreement to adopt the government jargon Relocation and internment, not concentration or prison camp. To be as American as possible, having to prove your loyalty even though you were born here. And when your daughter hungers to know about your life in camp, you giggle about the hijinks, girls, and being prom queen, a typical teenage life. It suggests your secret mounting dread each year as December 7th approaches, even now, over 60 years later. Shikata Ganai means end of discussion. I don't want to talk about it. There's nothing more to say. Thank you. OK, next um, we're going to have um, I hear from Brian Comey Dempster. And um, his debut book of poetry is also named for one of these camps. And it was published by Four Way Books in 2013, and it received the 15 Bytes Book Award. I, I'm fascinated. I want to ask you guys afterward, but I'm fascinated at how poetic the names of the camps were that you both were able to take the names of your books from them, um, Topaz and Heart Mountain. Um, uh, so Brian is the editor of two anthologies, um, From Our Side of the Fence, Growing Up in America's Concentration Camps, and Making Home from War, Stories of Japanese American Exile and Resettlement. His poems have been published in many journals, including New England Review, North American Review, and Plowshares. He is a professor of rhetoric and language and a faculty member in Asian Pacific American Studies at the University of, P of San Francisco. Please welcome Brian Comey Dempster. Thank you, Francesca. And thank you, Donna. It's great to have you here. And thank you, Roy. How is the mic? Should I? Is it pretty good? Even higher? Is that about right? OK, just let me know. So it's, it's great to be here this evening. And an honor, and thank you, Jody, for the powerful reading. This is the first time Jody and I have had a chance to read together, and it's a real pleasure. And I want to thank John in the back as well for filming tonight. That's really special for us. And for all of you being here for the first January reading, I don't know if you're aware of, does anyone know what Day of Remembrance is? 
Have you heard of the Japanese American Day of Remembrance? So this is February 19th, so it's in about a month. So I think tonight's reading is very appropriate to that. And so, like Jody, I've decided to focus most of my work that I'm going to read tonight on the Japanese American incarceration experience because of the nature of Day of Remembrance and the event. But as Francesca pointed out, some of the work does attempt to weave in other themes of identity. And I, as someone who was not in the camps as a Sansei third generation Japanese American, see sort of in this book, it's about not just the experience itself, but how it resonates and gets passed down to the younger generation. So that's what drove me to write the book. We also have a really special member of the audience. This is my aunt, Taya. And I don't know how many people say aunt, but we were having a debate at dinner about aunt or aunt. How many people say aunt? And how many people say aunt? OK, OK. So I'll stick with aunt, Taya. And Aunt Taya was actually in Topaz as a, you know, young girl teenager. And her sister, my mother, Renko, who will be referred to in this reading tonight, was about six months old when Pearl Harbor was bombed. And so they were in the Camp Topaz. Incidentally, my understanding is that Topaz was the name that the people in camp gave it. It was actually called the Central Utah Relocation Center, which isn't that interesting, right? But, you know, Topaz Jewel of the Desert became renamed, thankfully, for my book. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but it is more poetic and, and much better. So I'm going to read a poem that I feel is very appropriate for tonight to begin. And I know Catherine and Jody have heard this before, so apologies. But it's very important to set a historical stage here. It's called, I factor in my mother's division from her father with a sentence written by Lieutenant General John L. DeWitt in 1942. What I'd like to do is read you the sentence in isolation first because, you know, Jody talked about some of the historical context and this is a statement that was made by a general at this time and it was literal, not ironic. This is what he says. The very fact that no sabotage has taken place to date is a disturbing and confirming indication that such action will be taken. So as a university undergraduate learning Asian American studies, I come upon this sentence and it infuriates me because it makes no sense. It's not logical but then it's used as a political weapon to actually incarcerate people of my own heritage. So I had to write a poem in which I use that sentence with my own text, and so you'll now hear my responses to that. Still unbalanced about why. The very fact that there were no facts, just imaginary signs. My grandfather's choral prayer beads. His transistor radio he left glowing his son's burning leaves in their church backyard. Tall tomato plants pointing, no sabotage, toward the east. Among thousands of suspected suspects, grandmother and her kitchen drawer of knives, their daughters tuning into Imperial, twisting the radio knob to catch the static, though nothing has taken place except his wife's dress billows into a flare. 1942, 2,592 guns, 1,458 radios, 2,014 cameras. In the long division to date is grandfather erased from my mother, her two-year-old face crossed behind barbed wire, a numbered tag attached to her coat, fabricated formulas a disturbing tunnel to a storehouse of invisible guns and dynamite where her father supposedly hides when he's really trapped in an open desert far from his daughter, coughing in her steamer trunk crib. These facts of her and confirming indication of me and this page swirl into a topaz blur of over 60 years ago and the calculation storm with sand counting her out and she wonders now 
that such action, along with the vanished scent of her father's breath and skin, how her heart continues to open, and when it will be taken. So the next poem is for my Aunt Taya, and she appears in this poem. I don't know if you know this, Aunt Taya. You've read the book, right? Right? Okay. Well, <laughs> she makes an appearance. And part of this book, in the last poem, a church was referred to. And what's important to know is that my grandfather, Ty's father, was a Buddhist priest. And their family was uprooted from a church home. So they lived in a home, which was the church, the Buddhist church. And during that time, Archbishop Niti Nishida, my grandfather, was taken to various, we were laughing over dinner, Department of Justice camps. Catherine and I were chuckling about, yeah, that's justice, right? So he was taken about five or six places. And in the meantime, my grandmother and aunts, uncles, and mother were in Topaz, Utah. So I come back to the church, the speaker of the book, and the speaker finds all these objects in the church. And one thing is the steamer trunk. And, I, you know, what is the steamer trunk that says topaz carved on the side? What was the history of that object? And so this, my poem, is an attempt to reimagine the history of this object that I found in the attic of the church many years later. It's called Steamer Trunk. You know us well, from Brendan teething in the church to my mother's fenced-in thirst, from the possibility of chocolate to the tinny taste of eel. Slow carrier of silver and sand, from distance and troubled time to us and our son Brendan, who in unknown sympathy wails on your lid like his baby grandmother did in Topaz prison camp for her absent father. Makeshift crib built by his gloved hands, a wool blanket stapled as lining for your splintered wood skin. She quieted in you, calming to cricket song beyond barbed wire, her body sheltered by you from the cold that pushed through cracks of the barrack door. Strong box of only what we can carry. My wife Grace towels off Brendan, and I set him down on his nursery floor, pry you open, with a crowbar. We unload your bent tinware and brittle wicked candles set for meals of unagi from jagged lids of dusty cans on my mother's birthdays in Topaz when her sisters Nori and Taya draped you with wrinkled lilac silk. Barrack heirloom table they squatted at. We sweep out and fill you with Brendan's iron clothes and toys. Between sips of bottled milk, he crawls up to touch your sides. We wipe clean, tugs at your last temple chest of rusted sweetness. I noticed that Jody mentioned sweetness in one of her poems, too. So we move ahead. And I'm going to skip ahead to a, a poem that extends that theme of living in this church, which is like a repository of history and culture. And these characters of Grace, Brendan, right? This is my wife and son. And some of this is autobiographical. Some is imagined, of course. But this site of inspiration, you know, I have to read this poem, Chandelier, because as I look in front of me, you know, this building reminds me of the Buddhist church that we're in. You know, it has that sense of a history and spirit and gravitas. And with this chandelier above us, let's hear the poem, Chandelier, and what that might represent in terms of a home and a family, and then being torn away from that object, the chandelier, which represents luxury and love and family. Crystal lights break, excuse me, crystals break light into desert stars. My grandparents' skies apart deemed traitorous. How do I clear them? 
Seven diamond spears stream down, twist above. Who took the missing eighth? Our absent, captured by one glassless string, ceiling latticed with leaf shadow, drop silver as blades of strangers who carved initials into the banister, scattered oak flakes on the stairs. Everywhere under guard, grandfather whittled scrap wood into shapes. Rainbowed conduits my family left behind, Grace and I reshaped the future. Imagine touching our son Brendan's shiny scar. Will his electric brain be quieted? I ride the black sea of her hair falling over my shoulders, the night tide of Brendan's breath. A truck rumbles outside, makes glass on glass magic. Mirrored doors of trains cargoing my grandfather, his face tinted by floodlit torches. The noon's sun magnifies, shocking his skin. On barrack steps, he shaved and sanded a carp figurine for his wife trapped with their five children in topaz, dull and barren jewel. In bed, Grace clings to me, and I wait for Brendan's next exhale. Inside prisms, our sun reflects us all. You're a great audience. I had a friend once say, do people clap after poetry readings? It's like, he's so uncomfortable clapping, you know? And then he clapped, and then everyone started clapping after every poem. <laughs> and then it was embarrassing. <laughs> no. So that is not a prompt. OK. <laughs> so this poem, I think you'll like it. It's called Measure. And it's for my uncle Kibi, Ty's brother, someone who meant a lot to us. And I'm just thinking about him tonight. So I'm just going to read it. It's called Measure. By the way, you know, one thing, and I think Jody would probably agree with this, I do think that the incarceration experience had a physical impact on those who experienced it. And I can't prove that empirically, but there have been research that shows that silence and holding things in can have a physical impact on the body in terms of trauma. And that's not just for incarceration. That could be any sort of violation that one experiences. So my impetus for writing this poem was my thought that maybe that's what happened to Uncle Kibi, a beautiful person who did hold things somewhat silent. It's called Me Measure. Uncle Kibi, did I come to see you as only half a man with your shaved head and lead blanket, half the weight, half the breath, half the smile, only half of you looking at the doctor who loaded up the transparency, used a ruler to show the tumor its increments, this angle 70%, that angle 50%, back at half again, in this case, your chance of living. One set of x-rays needed, a second opinion, a third, each arbitrary as the four vertebrae swarmed by the 4,123 diseased cells, the 7,000 blood count, 5,126 swollen lymphs, and the fact that there were three doctors, six orderlies, nine interns, only made calculations trickier. Two options, 48 weeks of radiation or 12 hours under the knife. Three pills a day after either treatment. Within one year, a 50% chance to live. A 250,000 deductible to cover cost after the eighth week. One oxygen tank and cane for full recovery. The one opaque streak vanishing from the transparency. The two cigars we smoke to celebrate. Our one-hour tennis match, the score 6-3, because you didn't want any measure of pity. My five aces, your four double faults, no strategy against the three opaque streaks growing back into the transparency. The 29 steps to your room where I tied the white laces of your gown. The one tuna fish sandwich I brought you Sunday, the 7th, at 8 p.m. Two bites, 
while you looked out the window at two sparrows darting back and forth, warbling atop one branch, a single pine cone falling. So that honors QB. I'm just going to read a few more. And I would like to read just a couple so that you get the sense of what is juxtaposed to the incarceration experience in the book. Because I felt that as a third generation, it was very important to think about what were the resonances of that experience. And one thing I felt was that what happened in World War II with Japan was inseparable to what happened to Japanese Americans here in America. And so there's poems in here about the Nanking Massacre in which the Japanese army invaded China. And I want to read this poem. I've never read it publicly, but I, I think that you as a literate and very smart audience, I think, will hopefully appreciate it. It's, it's called William L. Lawrence, Journalist on the Plane That Bombed Nagasaki years later in bed with his wife. And I think it's much too easy to vilify people in the past and to make them one dimensional. My interest in this poem was more about sensing, I read this essay that he wrote about being on that plane and I sensed his guilt. You know, I sensed the sense of, you know, even if it was subtle remorse. And so I thought, what would it be like to live with that, right? What would it be like to live with the fact that you saw the bomb being dropped on Nagasaki as a journalist? So hopefully this is an act of sympathy and compassion and an act of understanding writing this poem from Lawrence's perspective. This is my attempt. Moving forward or back, which way am I? I wake grasping your nightgown. I am still there, in the haze of faces burning, arch of spreading flame, black-haired girl in saddle shoes and plaid skirt, knee-deep in a yard of violets. Her father in clogs, pounding a path home, balancing buckets of carp on a bamboo pole. Daughter, father, splash of carp, magenta rose, White lights, flash bulb zing fades as I cling to silk's edge. Slats of ribs, a bridge I take to your belly's bulge. My pollen inside you, nubs of arms and legs, hands with fingers petaling, vases of roses on the nightstand, your gold ring engraved with my initials. The father, feet from the gate, his daughter kneeling with shears, pruning flower beds. Sealed in sheets, I draw close to your body, place my ear against flesh, listen to the rhythmic thumping inside water. So I'm going to finish with two poems, and this is an accompaniment because Jody read A High Boon, I have to do it. She inspired me. Also, I met Phyllis tonight. Where's Phyllis? And she's recovering from a mild concussion. And doesn't she look great? She, f she fell off a horse. And I promised her I would read a poem that has a cloud image in it because she said she saw a black cloud after her concussion. So th this will be this and the next one. So it's called Black Sky. And it follows the poem I just read. Now it's from the perspective of someone who was in Hiroshima trying to imagine a couple there as this happens, right? And unexpected, you know, you don't, you have no idea this is about to happen. It's called Black Sky. And the speaker is a woman. And there's a husband in the poem too. The flash so fast, it catches me here in the frame of a window looking out. A blur of spokes, you're getting close, pedaling hard, bamboo basket brimming with peaches. Behind you, the orchard, your ladder swept up in flame. High in branches, 
You had picked Momo as I steadied you below, your shirt billowing, carrying the scent of sugar and salt. The basket nearing full, I walked the path home. I washed the fruit bowl well, waiting for your return, and the soap foam dissolved into water. These moments take no time. The dust plume of your bicycle, wheels spinning too slow to escape lilacs that burn. The black sky captures us, inked words, stains on my white apron, strings untied. You knew ripeness by touch, one hand tracing my hip in the steaming furrow. All of this singed with nectar. A grove of ash, blackened leaves through windows, the roof consumed. We reach through scorched wall, light filling us, our bodies of fallen snow. I'm going to end with the last poem in the book. And I referred to Nanking earlier. I don't know if anyone's read Iris Chang's incredible book, The Rape of Nanking. It's so incredibly powerful that the first time I read it, I got nauseous. I got, had a visceral reaction. But it really made me rethink about, like I said, the Japanese identity and the Japanese American identity got falsely conflated during the war by the government. And of course, I understood the resentment and anger towards what the Japanese did in terms of colonialism and imperialism. But problematically, that was displaced onto Japanese Americans here who had nothing to do with that. My wife happens to be Chinese. And her name is Grace. She's Chinese Canadian. And her family happened to be affected by Nanking many generations ago. So I wrote this poem. And it's the end of the book. And I hope that you know, Francesca said this beautiful thing in an email to me. I don't know if she realizes it really touched me. But she said that the book had beauty and devastation. And I hope as poets that we try to capture both those things, maybe not always in the same poem. But sometimes we have to commemorate the devastation and find beauty in it. So this is called Over the Earth, Nanking, 1937. And by the way, the speaker is obviously someone at that time, a persona. I don't want us to end here wondering who will be first, our eyes lowered as the soldiers raise their blades, slicing those ahead of us. Kneeling by the gutter, I conjure our home in fading light. At the kitchen table, you opened a bottle of plum wine Unwrapped paper, lifted the vein to fillet soft meat. Now their swords strike closer. The ground shifts with each head cut from its stem. I hear the thud of your rolling pin pounding flour, the dust rising like bone smoke. The edge is near, my love. Skies darken into our room. The clouds, a line of ivory buttons on the blue silk of your dress. Thank you so much.